Thank you for joining us on Worldwide Slot Car Chat on Zoom, number 109. Great gang of regulars going here. Jeremy, John, Mike, John, J-Rod, Luff, Gary, Dennis, Garth, Neil, Don, Bill, and other people. And we're going to talk about slot cars. Uh, as always, all forms of slot cars are welcome. If you were thinking that last week's 143rd Spotlight was uh, preferential, come on and give us a, an HO spotlight or a commercial spotlight or a drag racing spotlight or whatever. If you want to showcase your kind of slot car racing, whether it's a different facet of a scale we we all here already use or a different scale or, or whatever, come on, come in. We won't bite. We'll have fun. That out of the way, we start with show and tell. Does anybody have any show and tell other than me? If so, raise your virtual hand and we'll be sure and get to you. Uh, and since I don't see, oh, there we go. Jeremy's got his virtual hand up. You want to get started, Jeremy? Oh, that was that was quick. I have two things. First <laughs> is uh, these wheels are Greg Galb specials. Let's see uh, there. Ooh, those are. Uh, nice. I just I don't have any chrome paint. I was hoping they're the Ninco wheels that he made i pulled them out of your file i can't remember those, what file that was those prints are better than mine <laughs> no yeah, I was gonna say, those, those prints look really really good yeah they're not Very too shabby nice. i just i don't know i don't have any acrylic uh chrome paint so maybe next time i'll just spray them chrome yeah uh, the, uh, yeah it's got chrome spray otherwise yeah. uh, krylon have a very nice they call it shiny aluminum and okay. that looks quite a, kind of close to chrome yeah <laughs> I, I sprayed them black and then dry brushed them to get the the details come out with that if you really want to be accurate though uh jeremy um in the day those those uh wheels were painted silver they were never chromed because oh, chroming really? actually weakens metal so they were actually silver in color the only thing that that was chromed was the knockoff i see and the second thing i wanted to share can i share my screen here yep does this screen come up it's coming up yep okay. now we see the track so I started working on my track and I laser cut a bridge. I wanted like a bridge truss over here. Yeah. And then I was like, why don't, why don't I just sell some advertisements on here? So then I laser cut some recessed at, uh, you know, advertisements on the side. And then I did it. Uh, oh, that's the whole thing. Let's see. Yeah. But and on this, this side, I did, you know, Firestone, Texaco as I went. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I seen like some of the commercial guys are putting out uh, these like golf signs. So I, I thought, oh, that's easy enough. So I cut that out and nice. here we go. Jeremy, how did you make your rocks? Uh, styrofoam and foam spray. Boy, they look really nice. Hey, thanks. Uh, I think Boone's, Boone's slot car gave me the idea to use the spray foam because in the old days, I would have just cut it out with foam. Yeah. So that is it. Yeah, Boone's is a great channel. If you're not already subscribed, he you, you you'll have nice a, layout that looks so good yeah i didn't even remember seeing the rocks before how how new is that <laughs> yeah that was i the last time i shared like two weeks ago i had just had it lifted and i remember john said oh you got some elevation there and i was like yeah i do have elevation there but it looks stupid i might i better get going on this so i have a race in two weeks here i just i wanted people that to come in and go wow you know yeah. instead of just racing so I've, I've noticed that for some reason in our club there's a they they don't like magnetic track. They they're snobs. Yeah. So Can so you they're show all us that picture again, please. Uh, which one? Let me see. The, the overall one of the whole track. Yeah, it's I'm so sorry. Nice there's so much junk on here. I've been working on it, <clears throat> but uh, it's let's yeah, see. I think it's a great. Sixteen track. feet long by eight you. this way, and yeah. it's all R2 and R3s. I didn't want to tighten it up too much with like R1. I think you've done a brilliant job on that. Really hey, nice. thanks. Down at the bottom end, against the wall under the stop sign, is that just straight along there, or is there a little S? Uh, no, it just it just turns straight here, and then just okay. a hairpin there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't. Oh, that's I, nice. What that's... what I like about race coordinator is over here on the when you come through the racing, you, know, you can go either way, and the it's right in the center of the gantry. But when your race is over, it cuts power, so you just pick up your car at the same spot every time. Uh -huh. You know, because like and, and the other tracks that I race with, they don't have. Uh, four relays so there's guys always walking around finding their cars and it's over here and they got to go get it back there and it's like oh you guys are wasting so much time when i just want to race and they're shuffling around you know oh, oh that's what i was going to ask if we have a second is that is there any way when you cut power to apply full brakes to everybody whose power goes out 
is that easily done or not? Because I've noticed one thing is like when the power goes out on their lane, sometimes they'll coast all the way to the corner, whereas I, I'd want them to just stop within two, three feet would be nice. Yeah, cool. you would have to you would have to do that with another relay. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Moving on. But, but I was hoping there was something easy. Yeah, right, if, you, right, if you you have a relay where you have a normally closed connection uh, between the black and the the black and the red. Mm -hmm. I think Carrera um, sells one. That's a stop button. Well, it, it's there's a difference between a stop button and applying full brakes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I have uh, arcade buttons over here on the are on the left side that everybody can stop the track, but I just want something that when the track power dies, brakes are applied instantly. Because yeah, if you yeah, squeeze your trigger handle, you can coast sometimes, you know, a foot or two. Yeah. The, the problem though is if you put the brakes on immediately, depending upon where you are on your track, it could de slot the car. Yeah, that'd be funny. Well, the other, <laughs> the other question here is I, I think on the at least on, uh, with the tech slots um, box. I think when, you know, when you power down or whatever, I, I mean, the cars, even when they're analog, you can, you can set the individual brakes, brake settings. So that might also throw some things off. You might get people rolling further, unless maybe That's I'm nice. misunderstanding. But you're That's talking about, nice. yeah, you, I was thinking of that box. Yeah, J Jeremy doesn't have a tech Carrera. Carrera track. He's got pure analog. Gotcha. So your, your, guys, right. your guys' suggestions don't apply. Not that they aren't you know, valid I got you. suggestions. If I had for... digital, I would take you up on that. <laughs> and it's not so much, uh, it, it, it's not so much that those, the, the, the career digital tech slots chipping the lane solution uh, does full brakes. It does whatever the brakes are set to, right? So you'd have to be right. driving full brakes in order to have it be full brakes at the end of the heat. Yeah. Um, Dennis, I don't know. I'm not an electronics guy. I know how things work. I know what things do, not how they do it, as far as electronics go. But if your relays are not uh, open closed, if they're if they're relays that switch from one thing to another to two separate closed circuits, could the other circuit? An electronics guy would have to look into this, obviously. But I was thinking if it if you can connect to the other side of that relay switch, you could probably connect some kind of resistor or short or something uh, like that. Relays, relays have always, they have two sets of connections. Yeah. Well, they have, they have two modes of switching, let's put it that way. Uh -huh. So you can, you can wire up a relay to be normally closed or normally open. And that means when there is no power on the relay, is the connection connected or not connected? In other words, do you want when you add power to the relay, do you want it to switch the circuit on or the circuit off? Okay. So all of our track core buttons, those things are normally closed, uh, normally open, right? So when you apply power, uh, wrong way around. When well, when you, you apply... press the button, you're, you're channeling power to the relay, which triggers the switch from normally closed that's to normally open, power to the to open. Normally open to, to break the connection to the power. Correct. So yeah, I think. and on TrackMate, on TrackMate, you can do it either way. Uh, you can tell the system uh, whether the whether the relay is connected, normally open or normally closed. Now, the brakes on a on an analog track, basically, when you let the controller off and you and the and the the controller trigger hits the hits the brake contact, what it's doing is it's connecting the red and the black wire. So it's making a short across the motor. Yeah. Right. The problem is that if you've got a if you've got a track power relay in the way, the track power relay is also in the black wire. So if the track power relay is open, so there's no power to the track, then uh, the controller is not controlling how the um, brakes how the brakes work. That's, that's okay, I got it. Yeah. All right. I was so, hoping there was something easy and simple, but if there's the way to the way the way to do it would be to have uh, either one or four relays that would connect the red wire and the black wire. Red and lane. black, when power goes out, it would have to trigger. And when power goes yeah. out, because yeah. they are set up for normally closed, they would close and that would provide you the short and the cars would stop uh, yeah. almost instantaneously. Uh, right. We used to do this on, uh, on wood tracks and uh, club tracks 
uh, where you had long straightaways. And if you didn't have it at the end of a heat where the power went off, you could actually break the car because it was going so fast that it would come out the end of the straightaway and hit something. So, uh, yes, it can be done, and that's how you do it. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Jeremy, Jeremy. I, I'd say just keep it simple and just rig some sort of crash barrier two feet beyond the finish. <laughs> no, it's okay. I just didn't. I don't. When people coast off of a power outage, they can make it all the way to the corner. And I was just kind of hoping they would only have to walk two feet instead of walking, you know, five feet for their car. But it's you worried about how far they walk. I'd be worried about whether they were going to overtake me or not yeah. on the yeah. coast. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've I've won a fair number of races just on coast because yeah, me yeah, too. <laughs> that's true. Especially I don't even I don't even have to worry about holding the trigger when it when the power cuts because the slotted controller doesn't. I can choose whether it does brakes when the power cuts or not, and I have it set so that it doesn't do brakes when the power cuts. So most of the other guys in the club don't don't have the internal clock accurate enough to predict when the power is going to get cut to remember to hold the trigger down. So I usually coast past them now they know and, oh they've known for all this time and that's what that's where the whole you've got a battery in your controller joke comes from is because my car coasts and theirs don't quite coast so much but yeah there's advantages and disadvantages to coasting so jeremy curious, uh, jeremy i'm curious do you have you have a, a call button specifically for each and every lane to control yeah. and monitor um yeah, I have the each usage. call oh. button is a joystick button, and each one is wired to a different pin on the Arduino, so it knows yeah. the red lane hit the pin. So, gotcha. Also, what's nice is on race corner, you can say you have if you hit that button three times, you're out of the race. Yeah. So gotcha. there's nobody forgetting. Was that two outs or three outs? So it's just let the computer do it all. Let, let us keep track of it. There we go. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of that uh, enhanced uh, settings and things like that since I've been well. Yeah. <laughs> All right, good good show and tell, Jeremy. I guess I will go ahead and do my show and tell. <clears throat> so uh, this has basically been my holy grail, and it's an NSR version. This is basically the car that that sparked my nostalgic desire for blue and yellow cars. This this you know the Audi R8 in, in this livery, and I have the Scalextric one, and I've got various other versions and different Bilstein, you know, different cars with the Bilstein livery. And NSR <laughs> announced this livery several years ago. It was in their upcoming car list things. And I, I'm like, I pre-ordered that thing on day one, waited and waited and waited. And apparently it's never going to happen. It certainly hasn't happened yet. And then Gary Skip over there in UK land decided to make one. And I'm like, uh, can you make me one? And he's like, hey, you can have that one. So bought that up in a heartbeat. And he sent that over. And you can see Gary does a fantastic job with his paint and decals. And I took a couple pictures here of the sides. And I think I took a close up of the driver. And Sweet. I am super stoked to put that on. Oh, another set there. Are you on the phone? I am. You want How's us to it? come back? You are on the phone. Sorry. That's okay. You can be on the phone. Go ahead. Go off to one. If she's got mute. drugs for you, take a call. Pizza. Please mute me. Mute me if you don't mind, sir. Go okay. ahead. I, I can't get to your picture. You're on a Zoom call. I'll come back. No. Okay. So now that's. Greg, what chassis is that on? <laughs> uh, I, you know, I forgot to take a picture of the bottom, but I'm pretty sure it's their, the same NSR GT. Full blown NSR. Yeah. It's it's full NSR. It was a white kit that Gary did. Um, yeah, so it's I'm pretty sure it has the drop arm and everything. But yeah, I, yeah, I should have taken a picture of the bottom. Oh, it's good looking. It is, and I'm super happy to have it. And next up is did, did anybody have any additional? Yeah, I'm not sure that the Audis had a drop arm. Come to think of it, I think they're too early for that. I mean, I can go get it right now, but maybe we'll just swing back to that later, and I can I can confirm one way or the other. Um, and this is printing in progress of uh, the Dunlop Tower replica of uh, that's on Thingiverse, and I'll try to remember to put a link in the description. With uh, the crosswalk, the whole big tower crosswalk thing. Yeah, that's a big one. This one's this one's for a customer order, 
and I, this is the first time I've printed it. And this is only like a third or half of the pieces. Yep. This is all the pieces, and I had to, I had to stack them half on each other just to fit them all on the top of my deep freeze. <laughs> but it looks fantastic, and I cannot wait until uh, the customer gets it put together just so I can share pictures of of the completed unit. But of course, if you go to the Thingiverse, you can see, you know, the original designer, you know, printed one and assembled it and everything. So, sorry to interrupt, Greg, but did you actually print those separate colors for the lettering and? Yeah, these are all one print. So like, oh, so that's not painted, that's printed. Correct. And that's, wow. that's, one the, that's one of the things I like about this kind of 3D printer is that you can start with one color. So white is the base. And then it prints a few layers of white. And then the, the brown is doesn't start until a few layers later. So when you switch to brown, you know, the white is still behind the brown, right? So the window frames are still being seen. And we've got the brown and then the same thing the yellow comes up a, a few layers after that so you switch to yellow and then after that then then to black and i didn't even have to sit there doing it myself because i have a fancy machine to do it for you but you can do that on any uh filament 3d printer you know if you've got the colors it's just a matter of uh you know either being there and hitting the pause button and changing the filament or programming in your into your <clears throat> g-code so that the printer automatically pauses and waits for you to change the filament or in my case automatically changes the filament so yeah the, what you see the the done is one panel the lop is another panel and it goes to to the edge of the window there and to the edge of the wall um yeah and is it looks the like two lane version or is this the four lane version? I, I did the four lane so i did two crosswalk pieces okay um how long does that take to do something like that greg I have two printers. I had them both working for most of a week um, because most of the prints were not long enough for me to do overnight. Um, so basically when I have, I, I try to schedule the day of printing so that the longest prints I start at night and then it just keeps printing throughout the night. And then the next morning, either there's some time left or it's already done and then I can start a new print. And then the, the shorter prints I do throughout the day because I'll, I'm there to take them off and start the next print. Um, but yeah, this took a few days of both printers pretty much working constantly. Uh, but, uh, yeah, well, it, 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 looks, it looks great. Wow. It's a, it's a pretty well designed model. There are some parts that that are can only be held together by whatever glue you use. So there, there's going to be some careful constructing. You know, there, there are no tabs or, or you know, whatever to to help hold the pieces together. So your the guy putting this together is going to have to devise a prop or <laughs> use a quick setting glue to hold certain pieces together. Most of them printed fairly easily and flat. The most difficult print was was this tower top piece. That is a single part, and so. The first time I printed it without supports and it it came out okay, but but the bottoms of these uh, top bars were kind of saggy and didn't look very good after I kind of pulled off the saggy bits. So I printed it again with supports so that it's so that it's much cleaner. The problem is is this also very fragile and the uh, I shipped everything in one box and I did my absolute best to pack everything with plenty of padding, but this piece came broken in in many many pieces well I, I don't know about i don't know about in the u.s but as long as you didn't put fragile on the package you'll be fine <laughs> yeah well i didn't uh and yeah i would never bother doing that but yeah this piece came in too many pieces for him to glue back together so i printed it again and sent it in a box that was considerably larger than the piece itself with lots and lots and lots of padding and and you know I haven't asked him if it got there. Uh, I think he, it was delivered within the last couple of days. So I'll have to check back. I'm sure if it was broken, he'd have told me right away. So I'm sure it came through fine. Uh, but yeah, this is this is. I look forward to seeing that. And I was at Russ's last night for our club race, so I I saw this up on his shelf in a position of prominence. So I thought Dennis would get a kick out of seeing this in its fancy display case. So I took a couple pictures of that. Oh, thank you. That's great. I love it. 
yeah, I did the, the for those who don't know, uh, Russell uh, sent me that number seven and number eight. He had the bodies painted by uh, a much better painter than me, but uh, I did all the mechanical restoration underneath. So those are the two of the original Maseratis that were in the tin plate bodies that were in the very, very first scale extra uh, slot car sets that came out in 58 or 59 or whatever it was. So that was a fun project to do that. Yeah, and, and I, I didn't want to ask him to open the case so I could get pictures of the chassis, but <clears throat> his, his garage is basically a mini <coughs> slot car museum of sorts. <clears throat> he likes to collect things like this, but he basically has one or two pieces of something interesting throughout the years of slot car racing history. Like he's got some old, uh, he's got like a TCR, an HO TCR set, you know, the, the lane changing HO set. And he's got like a model motoring set. And, you know, he's basically got various pieces of slot car history more or less represented around his garage. Next time I'm there, I should take a bunch of pictures or or ask him to come back on with a bunch of pictures and share his little historical <laughs> slot car man cave slash museum slash racetrack facility. It's it's a lot of fun to be there. Uh, and I've got I, go ahead. I have a I have a photo of the underside of those. OK, go ahead and show that. Just, just trying to well, I'm just trying to get it up on my computer. There we go. OK. Yeah. Uh, I'm done with my show and tell anyway. We got some club corner to talk about. If anybody else has any show and tell, pop your hand up. Otherwise, we'll be moving on to another topic. Oh, well, don't don't forget about Brian. He's got his hand up. I, I, we're, we're getting this picture, and then we'll get to Brian. All right. So, can you see that? Yep. All right. So these are the chassis that were uh, uh, also tin plate printed. They have a bloody great lead weight up in the front there, which is riveted in which was part of the, it wasn't an aftermarket thing. It was maybe an afterthought during the, uh, during the manufacture, but uh, there's a big lead weight up the front there. And it didn't have a guide or a, or brakes. It had this revolving uh, jimble style thing here, which you can twist um, around this way. If you can see my cursor, it could twist from left to right and then roll <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then roll, and then it would actually pick up the the uh, the current on these pieces of this roller, and there were little um, feelers that touched onto the axle, and then it would carry that back to the to the motor, which was at the back. I don't know if I have photos of the motor. Let me see. I'm sure just hard metal against hard metal was uh, was was not a uh, consistent, reliable source of power. So it was a, it was a horrible way of doing things. But unfortunately, no, I don't have any. Those are the those are just just the, the photos that I took of those cars. And, and was uh, sir, Dennis? Was there just rubber between the two halves? Some sort of insulated between the two halves, John. I'm not sure what it was. I don't think it was rubber. It might have been bakelite or something like that. <clears throat> Cool. Hey, Greg, I want to take a, a step back to something you said. Uh, you were talking about the lane changing on the on the HOs. Yeah, I was watching uh, the guy that did the documentary on the creation of the 24-hour uh, Le Mans 132nd uh, scale. <laughs> and they were talking about having warmed up to it on HO scale. Does HO have digital? Can you do the... Not, not per se. Um, the closest thing would be the TCR, the Total Control Racing, where it's basically a C2 car. So the cars are each controlled by their controller, but you can't have more oh, than two cars. Okay. So once, you know, basically one car picks up on two of the three rails and the other car picks up on the other two of the three rails. And there's a, there's like a solenoid or something that, that makes the car kick over into the other's into the other set of rails that you push push a button on your controller uh -huh. to make it kick one way or the other. Or it will just go to the outer rail in a turn that doesn't have the little wall. Like they make turns with, there's a wall between the right, two right. rails. So yeah, it was, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't quite put that in the digital category, but <clears throat> yeah, there's currently there is no digital in that scale. 
There's Digital and 143rd, which you probably know of Carrera, uh, D143. And there are people in the world with enough expertise to make extremely small, fully capable digital chips for slot cars that would fit into uh, some HO cars, especially those like from uh, Skelectric, the Skelectric micro cars and similar cars. But the the <clears throat> the challenge is, you know, okay, there's a chip. There's no HO skill lane changer <laughs> tracks. Well, I, was, I was just wondering when I heard you say it, and then he said it on the documentary of the lane changing. I was going, like, wait, yeah. they change lanes and HO? That's I never knew that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Looks like Brian is ready to do his show and tell. Take the floor, Brian. All right. I'm going to try the share screen thing here. I'm on my phone. Last week, I showed you guys a some Tinkercad drawings that I had done of a hot rod. Is that showing up? Not yet. After you hit share and then pick what you're sharing, you got to hit share again. I've never done it from a phone, so anybody out there who's done it from a phone, feel free to chime in. Yeah, let's try this. Anything showing up yet? Not. Oh, here we go. Something's coming. Brian has started screen sharing. Can we see? I see that you. There we go. Chassis. Now we see the chassis on the track. All right. So All right. There's the chassis I built for that. Um, let's see. I think the problem here is going to be switching between pictures. Hopefully swiping works. Well, I'm in the gallery though, which is kind of. Yeah, let's see. You say it was on his phone. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't want us to see the new pictures of his girlfriend. Oh, you've already seen them. Yeah, don't swipe right. <laughs> Brian, while you have that picture up, uh, the front tires on that chassis, were those uh, uh, 3D printed as well? No, the front tires are actually off a slotted uh, Ferrari 312. They might out at 16.75 to give you an idea how low profile that actually yeah. is. Let me try this again here. John, the tires have probably been painted with uh, nail varnish. Or, I was going to say, it looks uh, like they're coated. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. This is not going how I'd hoped it would. So let me try this one more time here. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <And> then... <laughs> all right. So now we see your actual device screen with all the app shortcuts. Oh, this is like nine degrees in Belleville or something. So now we should basically see whatever you do on your phone. Ah, can you, can you see that? Yeah. Yes. All right. So <clears throat> that was the bottom side of the chassis. I'm assuming you can see that. Yep. Okay. Just to give you an idea, I used a really thin magnet. And speaking of magnets, all you non-mag guys, if any of you got any bunch of the slotted size standard magnets, you uh, are tired of moving around your shop, I would gladly take them off your hands. Just let me know. <laughs> Having a hard time finding the magnets and sizes I needed in bulk. So, mm -hmm. all right. So. Oh, nice. All right. So this was the original, cool. as oh. you guys thought. That, oh. that, look, that looks better than your drawing. It looks really good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this is how the car looks. It is from the front. Now, I did make a, a subtle change here in the grill. On the other one, I had like 10 slats in the grill. But when I printed it, the lines are so fine that you really don't, from a foot away, you don't see it. So I went with larger openings. There's kind of the back end. Let's see. 
Now, this one's a little bit different. And what I did is subtle changes. I made the car three millimeters taller. And one of the reasons I did that, if you look at this, this is the original drawing. The top of the motor is level with the bottom of the windowsill. So, I mean, if you wanted to put a driver in there, you couldn't really. I don't necessarily plan on it, but it's, it was a possibility. So again, there it is as original. So I did it again and I made the car, I made some subtle changes. I rolled the body back on the chassis just a little bit. I moved it back about a millimeter and a half, made it three millimeters taller. And if you look, you can see the body here now is just tiny bit taller than the tires, which are 20s. I didn't like them, but they were 20s. And I think it made a significant difference in how it looks. Um, I'm thinking for the better myself, but I'm kind of undecided yet. So there it is from the side. Do, do you have a picture of the comparison between the, the changes? I do. Oh, I sorry. Do. Yep. So here they are side by side. Now the, the subtle differences of shifting things in here really didn't make a, a difference in the overall size of the car, strictly the height. I mean, I moved the scoop back a little bit, but those cars are identical in width and length. But the one on the left is three millimeters taller. You know, you, you might want to add maybe um, another set of slats for the rad to take the sort of heaviness out of the front. Um, I think when you see it, it's not as heavy as you might think. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, that's okay. Uh, the pictures can be a little deceiving. Now, again, here they are side by side. The front car here is the original. The back car, again, the scale purport, or, um, perspective here kind of throws this off a little bit because it makes that back car look a lot shorter. It's not. It's the identical length. It's just three millimeters taller. Again. Yeah, the, pro the profile looks great. So they are nose to nose. Again, the only difference is three millimeters difference in height. And it looks huge, but three millimeters is not very big. That's right. And just to give you some perspective as the overall size, that's a slot it. Well, Elf. as I've said many times, Brian, three millimeters is the difference between ooh and ah. Yeah. I mean, that looks like a 143rd uh, rat rig. <laughs> Almost, but the, the wheelbase, if you look, it's actually longer than the slot it is. And now, again, those slats look huge, but in reality, they're, I mean, look at the size of the axle. You know, the slats are half that size. So I think they're one millimeter tall or 1.25. So. Wow. Well, and it, it, it that looks like a really nice print too. So again, there she is all finished. Now that's the tall one. And my thought was maybe what I would do is I, the, the tall one would also be a nice basis for more of a standard length hot rod where the front tires would be about where the vents are starting on the side there, it'd be back about halfway between where they're poking through the body now and where those vents are. You know, do them something a little wider and a little shorter and maybe use the, the skinny one, do an open cockpit type thing with, you know, like a roll bar. Hell, some of these Bonneville cars even had bubbles. Um, you want to talk about a variety of styles for, uh, for cars, Bonneville is, is insane. But uh, that's where she's at. And this, interesting enough, I think this, this car is one of those bodies and designs and types of cars that I could get away with just primering it and leaving it alone. And if you threw some numbers or something on it, it would work. With, and, and put the numbers on with uh, one of those old liquid whiteout yeah. brushes. <laughs> you know, it, it might also look neat if it were dirtied up. Yeah, uh, little strips of masking tape for the numbers. Yeah, like it's been oh, on a, go, like yeah. a run. Yeah. 
I'll I'll send it to John Kitt and let him do his the one he did on uh, I think it was one of the three fifty sixes he did by hand. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, and it's fun. It's fun to do too. <clears throat> have, you, have you driven it yet? Oh, it's a beast. That, that's a twenty five thousand RPM Predator in it. The car probably weighs sixty to sixty five grams. <laughs> yeah. it's, not, well, it's got a magnet in it, but it's got about half the magnet that say a standard Carrera does. So it's, it's, yeah, it's quick. It's, it's quick. Um, was that like a, a more of a bar style magnet turned on its yeah. side or was it? Yeah, that's, that's a 20 millimeter by I think three millimeter by three millimeter. And I'm not sure okay. what that came out of. I originally drove the chassis. I can take a 15 by five, which is your standard slotted magnets. And I actually bought some in bulk, but they're weak. They're really, they're not nothing like I expected. Yeah. So I'm still shopping around. So like I said, if any of you guys got slotted magnets you don't want anymore, just uh, wave your hand and I don't know, maybe I'll swap you a for them or something. Well, and, uh, the, the, the tough part, Brian, is getting them off the fridge. Yeah, well. They're handy for flattening cool. chassis and, and uh, <laughs> various other things. But yeah, you know. That's all I got. All right. Thank speaking, you for speaking right. of flattening chassis, have you guys seen the new NSR chassis flattener? Yeah, of course. Dennis made a fantastic video for Electric Dreams about it. No, <laughs> no I didn't. Dennis. Hey, no, hey I Brian. haven't done that. Not yet, anyway. Oh, I must be mixing it up with the with the Huddy Buddy. I did the Huddy Buddy. I haven't done. We haven't seen them in the flesh yet, but they obviously are on their way. The sound they sound good. pretty neat, but they actually heat up and you know. Yeah, I think that I'm sure that when we have a chance to have a close look at them, we'll see that there's a fair amount of fairly fancy temperature control involved there. Yeah, the, there's, there's two there's two modes. There's a manual mode where you are responsible for temperature <laughs> management, and then there's an automatic mode. So it's obviously programmed to detect when the plate reaches an optimum temperature and then, and then hold the it there. Or, or hold it there yeah, for a certain you, amount of time or just let it yeah, cool down slowly. You're trying to, you know, you, you've got to try and allow the allow the chassis to soak up some of that heat before things start melting yeah interestingly i mean nsr provide a variety of chassis stiffnesses right mm -hmm. are they if you took a, a a soft chassis and a hard chassis or whatever and put them side by side would their measurements be different like would it would there be thicker ribs in the stiffer no. one uh, so it's, it's all in that it's all in the plastic. plastic. All in the plastic. So that so that means that the different chassis will probably have different optimum temperatures. Maybe they may may not be far enough away from each other to make a big difference. So. That's true. They they might be doing it at the lowest safe temperature for whatever this this the the lowest temperature is of all the chassis, and the rest of them are flattened well enough by that same temperature. Something like that. But yeah, that's, that's an interesting new piece of hardware hitting the market. And if anybody gets one, absolutely show and tell it. And we definitely want to hear about your experience with it. All right. Uh, I'll remember for next week. No, I won't have one by next week. But... I was going to say next week, really, already? <laughs> but i got to wait for Marco to get back from the UK, I guess. You think you'll bring one back? Uh, if he doesn't, I will have something to say about it. He Mr. Might. Underwood, did you did you get to play with one? Uh, well, I didn't play with it. I managed to um, pick it up and hold it. Um, 50, 50 comments on it. Um, most of us already got um, steel plates to do it with. Um, and speaking to some of the distributors that were there looking at it as well, they'll buy it and people will buy it. You know, they'll buy it and they'll sell it onto us lot. You know, in the community. So, um, 3D printing, it's like um, looks like a piece of granite type material on the top, and say so it's got a little switch on it. Well, I, I assume everyone's seen the video of it, so um, we'll have to wait for it to come out in the market. I mean, we know Tony will buy one. <laughs> you know, when I when I saw it being displayed, I thought of Jeremy's um, uh, yeah, weight sure. thing because if you do have a warped gas a little bit. That's going to throw the weights off and stuff. So it'd be two neat things to have in conjunction with each other. 
side by side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Jeremy, get that thing made. Yeah, get get it done in one piece, Jeremy. That's your next project: a a chassis flattener and four wheel weight <laughs> in one unit. And Coke machine. And Coke machine. <laughs> and toaster oven. All right. Any other show and tells? Looks like we're having a, a slim showing for show and tell this week. Yeah, I got one. All right, take it away, Gary. Yeah, I just got me a uh, Thunderslot, a Lola T70. It's one of my favorite slot car bodies. Yep, nice. <clears throat> it just came the other day. Yep, that's the body I ran in the club. Actually, the, the, the T70 Coupe was the first one they brought out. And some of those are still the fastest of all of them. They're really, really nice. Yeah, the thing is fast on the track, too. And, and when you let off the throttle, boy, it stops quick. At first, I thought I had a magnet, and it stops stuck on good. <laughs> so I checked it, and it doesn't have a magnet. But, boy, it handles pretty good. I was really surprised. And it is fast. <clears throat> and then the other car I got is to race on Bob's track. He uh, has a stock car class, and I didn't have any scale electric slots, uh, stock cars, so I got this one to uh, race at his track. And uh, I took the magnets out of the course, and he runs magnets, so I didn't do so well. <laughs> but I ran pretty good, though, for a car not having magnets, but it's got a narrow chassis, which makes it really hard to handle in the turns. I wish I had a wider chassis. He uses a lot of the uh, uh, Chevy, um, I can't remember what. Monte model. Carlo? Yeah, the Monte Carlos. And surprisingly, they got a wider chassis than the Thunderbird. And I thought they'd be about the same, but they aren't. So it made it a little bit harder to keep up. Uh, but we had some fun racing anyway. <laughs> The Monte Carlo is so much better than the the other one Ford. It's not. It's like oh yeah, close. That, I, there's no doubt now. I, yeah. I didn't realize there was going to be that much of a difference, and I got yeah. this one on sale. So I said, well, "Let me get one so I could take this track to race." And yeah, it's I've unfortunate. Been better off those, with a Monte those are Carlo. <laughs> those are cool cars on the track. I mean, when they look good out there, but it's just they. It's not even close. I don't know how they got it that far off, but I guess they don't really test them against each other. Yeah, the same I thing had, happened I had with about, the Trans Am cars and the difference about 12 between the Camaro 14 and the grams of weight to get this thing to kind of halfway handle with the magnet cars. I was going to say that just what well, I mean, not to give you a hard time, but why in the world did you go with the that's like taking a knife to a gunfight? Why did you take the magnet out if you knew they I just magnets? wanted to try it out just to see if I, it could <clears throat> handle decent on his track because he's got a lot of wide turns. And this thing, I could keep up with them on the straightaways and the wide turns. Just the tighter turns is where they were they yeah. were getting me. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's fun anyway. And I'm so used to non-magnet. I I like racing non-magnet. Now, now here's the question: were, Was anybody there impressed by how how well you were able to keep? I mean, obviously they still smoked you, but were they surprised by how well you were able to keep up without magnets? Yeah, and Bob actually tried it out at, at first before we started racing. And he, he said, man, what would you do to this thing? Because it does do pretty good. I said I added about 14 grams of weight to try to compensate for the magnet that you have the downforce with. And uh, so he wants to race non-magnetic for just him and me and the other guys are pretty new at it. So yeah. he wants to have them use the magnets and then him and me try without it and see if we kind of equalize with the the new guys <laughs> yeah like a like a, a handicap of some sort yeah these. sort of yeah exactly where, where did you put the weight because those are big cars you've got everywhere to put weight well i i put them on each side of the motor and then i put one behind it and one in front of the motor and then i had a little bit up by the guide to make sure it would stay down in the slot so I had so it pretty much all, covering the whole thing. <laughs> so all over. Basically, you made a nice heavy chassis. Yeah, get, get a nice yeah. low center of gravity. Yeah. Did you yeah, do I was hoping that would work and do even better, but it 
It was fine. I had fun racing it. Did you guys use stock tires or was it a different tire? No, we got, we all had uh, the quick slicks and uh, silicone. Yeah, silicone tires. So yeah. he, he runs silicone on his track, which I do too. So that worked out pretty good. Perfect. And the only other thing I changed was the guide. Mm -hmm. She changes them too. I put a uh, Ninco guide on it because I got a bunch of them when I used to have Ninco's. They're, they're pretty long. I don't know if he could see it. And they're deeper than the scale electric. So it yeah. worked a lot better on his track. What kind of track does he have? It's a Carrera four lane Carrera track. Yeah. But that's all I have, but it was, it was fun racing there with it. Yeah. Did, did you measure the front to rear weight distribution when you, uh, you did it? I'm curious. He's waiting on Jeremy's tool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there was more weight on the back end because if you kind of hold it in the middle, you can kind of feel the weight toward the back. And that's where I wanted to keep most of it, to keep it from sliding out so much. But I put a well, little bit in the front just to keep the guide in the slot. It's, it's, I've discovered by measuring it that 40 to 60 is about the best. Um, if you, you can get 40% on the front. And if you want more traction, put it on the front first. Okay. Counterintuitive, but it, that's the way it works. I'll have to try that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I guess we're ready to move to Club Corner. Unless anybody else has any uh, show and tell, you can wave your real hand. John? He was talking about uh, stock cars. I forgot. I got this one this week. This is a white model that I turned into a Budweiser T-Bird. There you and go. It is fast as we it's a Carrera digital. This is what I had been running. But uh, um, I kept it magnetized and I really like it. It, it did quite well on our Pocono track. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll see what happens. Anyway. So did, so did they produce just a plain white carve? Yeah, like they have white Monte Carlos and white T Birds and white Dodges. Yeah. Now, it's hard to find the Dodges. I've been looking. I found one in Germany that's coming to me. But uh, they're just wide and you can, you can do whatever you want to with them. Yeah, and, but it wasn't like a, it was like Skelectric does it. It was a fully yeah, assembled. exactly. It was, it, was a, it was all made. It was yeah. it's just a, a white shell. You know? Yeah, yeah. Un, unpainted, ready to run model. Unpainted, right. <laughs> Good stuff. Glad you're having fun with the, with the NASCARs. Mike, you put your hand up. What's up? Well, actually, I have a question. Does anybody know of a plastic chassis for the Carrera stock cars? Like a 3DP? Yeah, 3D printed. I haven't been able to find one. Did you already go to the slot it shop on Shapeways? Yeah, I okay. did. And scrolled through a thousand different pages <laughs> of trying to find us like, Oh God! Chassis for what? I'm sorry, I wasn't. You the say? the the stock cars for Carrera. Carrera stock Carrera. Cars. Modern stock cars. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no, that's not it, no, no, no. Those uh, are vintage well, stock cars. Okay, so like the the super birds and stuff. The Dodge, like the the Dodge um, Charger and um, the Torino Ford Torino, so 80s. Okay. If I remember correctly, is that 80s or 70s? Uh, so. Uh, uh, late, late. No, that was early seventies. Yeah. yeah, Superbird was like a seventy. Okay. I haven't seen any. I assume you checked Oliver and and all the other. Yeah, the, the normal outlets don't have them. I just wondered. I I don't really want to get the building stock car chassis, but I want to try to see if I can um, get non mag stock cars. I've got the mag ones, and the mag ones are so much fun because they're they're all really close and they they fly but they're tippy so there's a there's quite a bit of we don't have so much magnet in them that it's that it sucks it right down but if you take the magnets out they're like whoa it's impossible almost <laughs> so well, anyway i just wondered if anybody knew of any well to anybody out there if you know of a 3d printed chassis either uh printable file or printed 
that can be purchased from somebody. A uh, job put it, for Greg. Put it in the comments. But uh, yeah, I, I assume nobody else. Uh, well, did, did, can you can you take a current car <clears throat> and take the chassis out of it and do like I don't know how your three D printing works. Work, work, work. <laughs> work is what makes it work. Yeah. So, Unless somebody has done the work, someone else will need to do the work. I am capable of doing that work, but I have very little incentive to do that work. Uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> so that's what I'm hoping is that there is already somebody who has done that work out yeah. there. That and, and so anybody in internet land who's watching this on YouTube can drop a comment saying, "Hey, uh, you know, there's such and such who who make who either make the model that you can download and print or that sell it." You know, through their own shop or Shapeways or something like that, that would be yeah. fantastic. But yeah, you know, like I said, you know, before, to to three D print, you can three D print anything that has been designed in a three D shape to be printed. Well, the next thing that needs to come out is like a laser scanner for things, so that it could go over it and photograph it and then turn it into a file. Yeah, those things exist as well. The the uh, the ones that are affordable to normal human beings churn out garbage, and the ones that don't churn out garbage are not affordable to normal human yeah. beings. I have one of those scanners, and you can scan like a coffee cup, and it will look like your kid painted it or brought it home. I mean, it's not quite exactly what you think. It's not like the future. Yeah, that's what that's why when whenever whenever you see advertisements for for scanners, 3D scanners of pretty much any kind, whatever the technology they think is the best technology, whatever they're selling you, look to see what they are showing off as being 3D scanned. 99 times out of 100, it's some kind of statue or bust or you know, a person or something like that where the, the tiny little triangles that it creates get lost in the organic shape of the object they almost never show a car body or some other you know mechanical thing that needs to have straight perfect flat surfaces or subtly curved shiny smooth surfaces because the resulting image is created by as many points in space as they can triangulate from the photographs or from their device that are then interconnected by lines and then you end up with tiny little pyramids all over the object. Uh, so yes, it would be nice if if what you want existed, it does not currently exist as far as I'm aware, which is almost always the second question by people who are not already familiar with, <laughs> with 3D printing and model designing. Can't you just scan it? I'm not trying to make fun of you. It's just literally the second question anybody ever asks about 3D printing. No, the answer is no, you can't scan it. You need to you need to design the model with a CAD program so that the resulting model is as perfect and pristine as possible because you're going to lose fidelity when you 3D print it. You're not going to gain fidelity by 3D printing it. You do, you do exactly what I do when my kids come in and say, Dad, I've got a question. It's no. No. Now, what was your question? <laughs> And people don't like to just hear the actual answer. They like to hear the buildup to the answer so that the answer is more acceptable having heard the buildup to the answer. <laughs> but yes, we all, all of us in here long for the day when you can just bring a handheld 3D scanner to, the, to your auto show and capture perfection that is before you in the real world and then print it at whatever scale you want. That is not today. It'll, it'll be on our iPhones and buttons. that'll that'll be when guys start marrying their 3D prints. I, iPhones have a 3D scanning capability. If no you, way. Yes, they do, and it is essentially photogrammetry. It, it is the kind of technology that I'm talking about. The affordable to mankind technology produces crap. Crap. <laughs> Unless you're doing a statue or oh, you know so, you know something where the where the smoothness of the surface does not matter one whit. It makes us uh, just appreciate all the more the guys back in the 1960s who would see a new car at some or other track somewhere, you know the latest Chaparral or the latest Cobra or whatever, and go home and have a couple of photographs that they took with their brownie or the Kodak Instamatic 
and they would carve up a mold and then and within two or three weeks you'd have vacuum form bodies out there uh it's just incredible how good some of those guys were well you know my next door neighbor growing up was a a draftsman for an engineering outfit and i was amazed at his ability to capture forms and shapes and, and, and in perspective and it's like it's a it's an art you know and i don't know if they're teaching it in schools anymore because of the computers do it all now but he was amazing at it yeah i remember in, in when i was in my chosen career was was architecture because i so enjoyed the drafting classes and the, and the mechanical drawing classes in junior high and high school and stuff like that and i remember getting all the the fancy ink pens and everything and doing the fancy perspective drawings. And I was the teacher's pet and all the, all the rednecks made fun of me for, for actually enjoying what I was doing. Uh, college cured me of that ailment. Um, but, but you're right there, you know, it's a wonderful skill to have to be able to put pen to paper and make something that looks like real life. But you're also right that these days I can almost guarantee if I, if I were to go to the same college that I went to, they would not be putting pen to paper. They would be sitting at computers because why bother? You can just. It's like when my, when my daughter went to AM, she wanted to be a designer. There were no design courses, but they had computer animation courses. In fact, Disney did a lot of recruiting out of there. So she took that for her design work. And when she got into the design world and she had to pick up a pencil and actually do something on paper, she was like, what, what's paper? I mean, yeah, you know, and, and people who are in, into that should definitely still put pen to paper, sketch, sketch on paper, because you can just do that with a with a tablet and pen interface, you know. On I, I used to teach college and the guy that I taught with, we, we were teaching writers and art directors, he would make the art director students hand letter all the ads exactly like, you know, it was if it was Helvetica, they had to do Helvetica. And I looked at him and said, you are an asshole, aren't you? Yeah, don't don't get me started on on lettering with architecture because <laughs> I'm a left-hander and n nobody knew how to teach a left-hander how to how to write when I was going through school. We're so far off topic. It's time to change topics. Mike, I assume you're done. Yep. I'm going to lower your hand and Big Den is ready for Club Corner. Take away. Take it away, Big Den. Right. Ah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, after two months, we finally got back to racing down here in northern Tasmania. So uh, I'll start off with a share screen. Click on that. Oh, look at that. Okay, so... Um, very pleasing to see we had 10 people last Saturday, uh, including a couple of new people. One was a chap I'd known probably for about 30 years, uh, started off in the 90s and uh, was you know, a kid then and about 40 something now. So it shows how long we've been around. Um, the standard wasn't always the best to start off with because you know, we'd had a two week break. So um, next one. So I'll just move to the next picture. Where are we? There we go. And we started off with V8 muscle cars. Oh, yeah. Look at those blue and yellow cars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're introducing a new new rule. You know, we're going to be <laughs> There's modifying our... Yeah. Um, I, I, I did, uh, Dennis Sampson, I did the unthinkable and raced the uh, the Mercury Cougar there. Mind you, I... Um, Changed the changed the, the scale electric guide to a um, to a uh, yeah a, a bigger better guide and I took out the very heavy interior and just put a lightweight tray interior in, so it didn't go too bad. It was just me didn't get it get enough laps, so just that, another that the black one. one, the black one. Yeah, okay. I was going to say it what was. are the rules because because I have that javelin the blue and yellow sixty three. And it runs like garbage. Were you guys allowed to yeah. put a bunch of weight in? Obviously, you could change the interiors. What else could you do? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, there's sort of a mixed bag, Greg. Um, 
uh, the car at the front, which was the, the most successful one, obviously, um, it's actually got a, you know, it's our um, expatric, expat Canadian who lives about, you know, 50 miles away from where we are. He builds these chassis and that's pretty much a brass chassis with just a scale electric body on it. Um, it's, you know, some of the, some of the others towards the back of the field are the same story. So uh, I guess if someone can have a full brass chassis, uh, uh, someone with a, you know, a plastic chassis should be able to make a couple of modifications that bring it up to speed, so to speak. So uh, sure. there's no hard, there's no hard and fast rules written down. We're just sort of, Okay. Just um, um, you know, we just sort of we wing it a bit. If, if someone gets too outrageous, we'd probably jump <laughs> up and down a bit. But was there a tire? Know. Was there a tire or motor limitation of any kind, or just just whatever well, you? Want? I think mo I think mo most people are just using the, like the standard standard scale extra eighteen k motor or something. Yeah, something uh, equivalent, and. Um, yeah, that's probably a, that angle's a better picture. Yeah, I, I would imagine that, that that javelin took a bit of weight <laughs> to be third. Uh, in. Yeah, I just I'm just not quite sure who, who ran third. Oh, Cameron. Yeah, um, he, he he would probably put a little bit of weight in, but he he, he drives pretty well. He's him and the uh, the other guy, the new guy that came in, uh, are uh, are buddies. So uh, he was. He, he, he sort of still wants to be a died in the wall 24 scale racer, but uh, yeah, we, we're talking him around to 32nd because it's it's a bit different to the 32nd scale he knew back in you know back in the 90s. So, and he enjoyed himself and he drove pretty well for someone that hadn't picked up a controller for probably 15 years or so. Uh, and it's almost like you know when I I'm always uh, <clears throat> impressed with how similar we have thoughts you know uh, among the group that we we're talking nascars early uh, jeremy brought the the nest nascars on i thought well you know he's stolen my thunder a bit because uh or should i say he's stolen my days of thunder and um because we did have we had the nascar class racing and you can see that the two scar electric ones are a foremost there i love those uh, two cars that yeah. whole series was great yeah yeah I love how you've got an 80s and, and you've got a, a pretty big mix, pretty wide range of years represented here. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's some some at the back are you can see the the SCX ones. The yeah, uh, well, they were called Cars of Tomorrow yep. SCX. Yeah, and then further back, the white one, the white and red one, is one of the earlier model SCXs. That has a bit. Um, you know, like Wayne often tries to get the SCX guide system working properly. Well, it just doesn't. So I loaned that car to someone and it just ran out of the slots on the tight corners. So uh, in the last couple of nights, I've been taking, I've been attacked the chassis and put a CG guide adapter uh, in it. So uh, it's going to be a different beast next time it hits the track. And there again. Um, and then the results. So it was yeah, uh, Cameron who won there. And saving the best for last. Revo, Revo slot. Yeah, they're all they're all Revo slot cars except for the one at the back, uh, the red and white one at the back, back right, which is um, a, a brass chassis. Um, built by Barry from a from a, our ex Canadian friend, and another look at him. And of course, the best was saved for last. And there I am. I finally got somewhere. <laughs> my, my mind, mind you, there was only a matter of three or four feet in it. You know, so you know so, what? Uh, Wins a win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, which I took great great delight in in. Uh, when when they we were asking oh who's who's in front on the track I you know the Cheshire cat smile came across my face and said well I'm down there and you're back there so and now um uh, the Hobart guys have started off their NSRF one series so I didn't I didn't race I won't be going down there till next week so I thought I'd uh, just show you their their NSRs that they 
turned out. They would have had it 12 or 13 racing by the look of it. Now, these are all NSRF ones. All, all NSRs, those, yep. And, and then I'll just go back a bit. Uh, the one at the back is Phil, who won, and he did a very similar colour scheme, the, um, the Kiki Rosberg test livery from Portugal some, some, way, some way back in history. You know? So, uh, you know, that uh, Chris's... Chris's, Chris's one. Chris's, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, Chris's photos were, were published in, the, in his article on building it. Uh, he did it, for a, um, did it for a friend, I think, at a, another club racer. And um, it was published in the English slot magazine. And the editor said, oh, the trick of the light, it makes it look yellow. But of course, the test livery was yellow rather than the McLaren ready orange. So um, then we're just uh, going to, they've been, they're just about to finish their sideways class. So just a few of the podium shots there about who, who's won and, and why. Interesting to see the Ferraris on the podium because this is usually on, on most of our tracks. They're yeah. not the quickest of those. Yeah, the, the, yeah, chap the, chap, yeah, the chap that runs is Bruce. He's a, he's a regular driver in those Tasman Cup proxies. And um, he's, him and, he's, him and he's, uh, he's a little younger than me and his son's probably uh, you know, mid early to mid-30s. And they both renowned as, as good drivers. They can drive anything. It doesn't matter how good or bad it is, they seem to be able to get the get the cars around the track. So um, he 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 he's he's got one of those super bird um, careers and it competes against the successfully against the Revel monogram cars and the other uh, historic NASCAR things. Um, and so they're sort of getting oh yeah just a. a that one wasn't on any of the podiums, so I thought it was a nice looking car, so it was shot of that. And we must be coming pretty close to the end of it, about there, okay, yeah. So I'll stop the share. Okay. And I'll just make, I got my sticky notes here somewhere and I'll just, um, I'll, be le I'll be leaving early today because I've got a, an appointment in about an hour's time, so um i'll uh if you if you see me fade out uh, unannounced you'll know why um mike the your query about the chassis the 3d printed chassis for the career is i'm not sure whether js bodies in england do one or not um mm -hmm. yes. some of our guys don't sort of uh, some of our english brethren don't take kindly to them but uh if, if you need to get one, that's something you'd have a look at. Um, I noticed um, Brian had the Predator motor in his little hot rod there. I've got some of them. I haven't run the cars yet, so I'm hoping to do that next week when I go to Hobart. Greg was inside my head. I just typed Tony Petrucci on my uh, sticky note here when the, the little... Um, NSR chassis straightener came up and about three seconds later, Greg said, I bet you Tony will have one. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> and then, you know, I'd, um, Dennis's earlier profanities when he was talking about lead weight, I just wonder whether he should should uh, rename that little device he demoed uh, as the bloody huddy buddy, you know, so. Um, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> And the uh, my final um, thing will be I've just oh, I really got a corny one here. Remember remember last yes. week when you had when you had the pioneer um, Dukes of Hazard cars up or whatever they were, and you said there was var various um, various forms of Daisy. The, yeah, um, I'm, I think there were seven. I think there were seven different Daisies, wow. and it goes back. And, and John Kidd will get this one straight away. I think it goes back to the days when Judd Strunk worked for Pioneer. Remember Judd Strunk? Okay, he had a song called, called I'll Give You a Daisy a Day. Yeah, day. Yeah, seven of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And a, a, quest, a question uh, before I go off. 
Garth, I just wonder whether you got any any design, uh, any idea of the price of those um, little hubs for the ranch design wheels, that the little inserts that the guy makes. Oh, is Garth there, is he? <laughs> He's right there. He's holding his hand up. He's I just ordered some. They're two bucks a piece plus shipping. Bucks a piece, okay. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right, I will thank. Thanks for that, and I'll um, I'll just fade into the background, and I'll catch up with you next week. <laughs> All right. Before before Big Den leaves, anybody got any questions or want to give him a hard time about his puns? Now is the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a little club corner. Jeremy, do you have club corner? Are you getting something else? Go ahead. I have a club corner, but go ahead if you want. No, you go. Okay. Uh, let me share the screen here. And we're sharing. Yep. Okay, so this Iowa model auto racing club, we had a race in Makoka, to Iowa, which, which is 60 miles to the east of me. And uh, that's about an hour away. So uh, his Jim's track here, it, it came around. Uh, can you see my mouse cursor? I don't know if you can see yep. the cursor. So it used to come around this way and then hook back up. So he added this extension here. So now you go under the track and then you come back over and this is about a 10 degree incline or a yeah, angle. So if you stop on this part of the track, sometimes you'll slide, your, your tail end will slide down. That's never yeah. a good thing. Yeah. Let me see, uh, is this picture still up? Yep. So this, this is the side and driver stations here, obviously. We had a record turnout for his track. It was 13 people. And wow. it was kind of an interesting day because we, we didn't have, maybe somebody else will have this, but we didn't, we use the same times we always use. We only have like six to eight people mm -hmm. and it, it got closer and closer. And all of a sudden it's five o'clock when I normally leave and we still got two classes to run on. Now here's the bad part. Uh, I left in the morning from my house and I thought I'm going to be clever because gas prices are so crazy. I'm going to ride my little motorcycle. Does this picture picture show up? <laughs> yep. So it's only 125 cc, and I'm a big fat guy. I just think that's funny—a fat guy on a little motorcycle. Is that so, a steam electric? No, I no. have. <laughs> I have Super a, Cub. an 80 cc, so I know how I know how yeah. it is. So 125 so, is is roaring compared it, to what I it mean. will do. It's fine. It'll do 62, no problem on the on the straights. But as I was there during the day, a wind advisory kicked in, and mm. the wind kept climbing. And all of a sudden, it's five o'clock, and we've got 50 mile an hour wind gusts, and I'm like, oh crap. So I head home and like uphill against the wind, I'm doing 40 on the highway. And I'm like, okay, I, this was maybe a bad idea, but anyway, everybody else had a good time, uh, record turnout. And we have races coming up next week. And then the week after that. So we have three weeks in a row here, which is kind of unusual for our club. So. Isn't there a scene from dumb and dumber? Um, of, yeah. <laughs> how dare not, you, sir? Not, you are off not. my Christmas list as well. Yeah, Actually, not, I was yes. gonna say I was gonna say something nice. The Beach Boys wrote wrote a song about that bike. Uh, it wasn't the Beach Boys. It was a knockoff of the Beach Boys. No, no, yeah, the, like no, the Hondells. Speed. No, the Hondells. The Hondells, yeah, yeah, but the Hondells recorded it, but it was written uh, by Brian Wilson. Was it okay? Yeah. Well, how did you carry your cars on that? Uh, I have a backpack. I have a huge backpack, and I have a uh, uh, a plastic carry case. I put on my backpack. It, it wasn't too bad. So, so if. It, 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 I just it, like it gets 100 miles per gallon, so I was like, "Oh, it's only gonna cost me five bucks to go racing. That's gonna be awesome." Otherwise, so, if I, I get my you know SUV, it's gonna cost me oh, whatever. I don't know what's gas is like. Yeah, but, but, but at least yeah, there's there's less of a chance of getting an, in traction with your SUV though, right? <laughs> That's true. So if if that bike turns over, do do you protect yourself with the cars, or do you take the hit yourself? I, I die. <laughs> It, let's be honest. <laughs> at that point, it doesn't matter. It's, yeah, I'm broke. I, I, I had a I had a Honda Elite eighty eighty cc yeah. scooter, and you know when you when you need to, you'd be amazed at how much stuff you can carry on those things. I mean, I got my girl on the back. I've got two bags of groceries in on the footwell. I've got another bag of groceries behind the girl on the in the basket. <laughs> you know. Well, and then we I'm in to, Iowa. Uh, so I just I drive it around town. It's great. But then if I stick to the back roads, I, I didn't see any traffic, but there was like a few strips where I had to get up on like a regular two lane highway. And I was like, whoa. Yeah. So yeah. I might try it again, but hopefully no wind. Well, Sorry. speaking speaking of uh, record turnouts and how that changes things, my club corner 
uh, is not specifically related to that, but the what, you know the number of people that attend on any given night definitely affect how the night is planned out. So with EMSA, we usually do King of the Hill, which is everybody runs one car around the track, you know, so it's basically heat, you know, the number of heats as the number of people. We usually do IROC, which is, you know, all the lanes and everybody rotates. So same thing again, the number of people is the number of heats. And then we try to squeeze in three full rotations of everybody in attendance. And our normal uh, sprint races are two minutes per heat. Uh, so when there's, you know, 11 people, that's 11, 22, plus 33, that's 55 heats worth of racing. Uh, I'm not a night owl, so I usually get pretty, uh, I, I, I go into Mr. Efficiency mode when there's that many people, and I'm like, Who's up next? Get them in the deck. You know, get them. You know, make sure they know they're on deck. Have them ready to hook up. Get their car ready to put on the track. Who's who's next up for IROC? Better know you're on deck and get to the controllers right away. You know, if if it's the series race, but you know, set those cars up and have them on the track because we're getting this stuff done. And I'm going home at the end of the night. I'm not staying here until eleven just because you guys want to lollygag between heats. Last, yeah. last That's night, go ahead. I was gonna say, yeah, I've noticed that too. Like, uh, the, the time spent between heats, shuffling around, getting cars, uh, checking time. Uh, we tied on this lap 47 laps. How do we figure out the tie break? I'm like, just let the computer do it. So, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Like, you, we waste way too much time in between racing and when I'd rather be racing. And, and doesn't a race coordinator have a, a, a between heats timer option that you can use it, too? It does, but he uses Trackmate and he doesn't he just uses it for timing he doesn't go into the features and i, I don't have time to figure it out so yeah yeah, and yeah the, track and the, has the same you can you could put it on automatic rotation yeah and, and, and decide race, how long between heats the race manager that we use does not have a, a between heat feature of any kind so it's up to the people there to 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 get the make sure the ball keeps moving and when there's many people, i'm i'm the one doing that <laughs> so, yeah time tyrant uh we were at Russ's last night. We, you know, Memorial Day. We usually race on Monday, so we raced on Tuesdays. So last night we're at Russ's, that big routed track with the huge bank thing. And and as some of you know, Russ likes to run uh, longer heats with the fuel. So you got to stop under the light bridge to refuel your car. <clears throat> Knowing that uh, <clears throat> the priority for some people is to have three rotations of the series race. And they're they're prepared to give up King of the Hill and IROC in order to get three rotations of the series race. That meant giving up IROC and King of the Hill <laughs> because we had 11 people. So that meant 33 heats and, and Russ wanted to do longer heats. So that's three minute, 40 second heats of 33 <laughs> and trying to get these people to do it in a timely manner. So, of course, I was on the ball. And some of the other guys helped, obviously, as well. And it was like, you know, if you're if you're not if you're not racing, you better be at a corner to marshal the next heat, or helping get the next heat of cars staged and ready to put on the track. If you are racing, go hook up. Don't don't screw around <laughs> talking to people or checking the stats or or getting your car or what. Go hook up. That's how I sounded last night anyways so the i love the the fuel racing at russ's track you know it's, it's the closest thing to digital i get with the analog group uh and we were running the revo slot gt2s uh we had porsches and uh marcos and vipers and stuff on the track so it was the cars run fantastic you know you get you get the tires chewed up that's pretty much all you need to do with those cars and they just run great and my car was running great. And one of the other guys' cars was running great. And we we discovered that if you don't have any incidents whatsoever, not a bobble, 
I'm not talking about offs. If you have a bobble, you're not getting 28 laps. But if you run a perfect race, no bobbles, no offs, no nothing, and you're, you're getting good times and you manage your fuel properly, you can get 28 laps in a heat. Me and this other guy uh, had quite a few perfect heats. Uh, you know, he had a number and I had a number. And it basically came down to the last few heats where we were both, you know, we knew, like, I'm not like one of the guys named Victor. He, he's got that internal clock. Like, he will count down the last few seconds of the heat, not having to look at any kind of timing device. He'll start counting down the last few seconds of the heat, and he'll be on the money. And he knows exactly how many seconds per lap to get a, a specific number of laps and blah, blah, blah. I don't have that internal clock at all. But at this point, even I knew that if I could get these last few heats out of the way with no incidents, you know, and this, and this kind of comes back to the advice I like to give to everybody when they're trying to do better, like there, you, you can get hot laps in, but for some reason, you just can't get through a whole race without crashing. Keep the tail over the rails. If you if you focus on your car, ignore the chatterboxes who might be right in your ear. Ignore and and this is the hardest part is fighting against the red mist of competition. Fight against that red mist of competition. Focus on keeping your tail over the rails, hitting your acceleration and braking points so that your car is not all over the place. It'll look like you're going slow, but you're going to find that you're passing people because they're wiggling and waggling all over the place. That's what I did all night. And I was like, just shutting everybody out. I, it, I had a good night. Well, I'll leave it at that. I had a good night. So now I'm going to share the results. Come on, share screen. There we go. So Johnny Greasebones, a.k.a. Eric Jennings, was my stiffest competition. Some of the other guys, uh, Mr. Ramjet here is is our uh, reliable, you know, he gets his laps in and he wins a lot of, of races because he he just focuses on staying out of trouble and getting his laps in. Pat's usually in there, you know, in, in the in the podium, but his car was having problems, you know, and then the rest. But me and Eric were were neck and neck. So I'm not sure how much you can see, so I'm going to move this out of the way. Each of us had eight wins, and you can already see 44 points. The points are assigned. First place gets four points. Second, three, four, uh, th you know, three, two, one for a four-lane track. So you you race until the power cuts off, and if you coast and you happen to co you're, if you're on the same lap as somebody and you coast past them you get the point that they didn't get because you coasted past them. So that's why coasting is a, is a good thing with our club. Same number of laps. We each got 327 laps. So same number of wins, same number of points, same number of laps, and same number of total laps plus points. Uh, but he got first place because at this point, the tiebreaker is fastest lap time <laughs> it so rarely gets to that that tiebreaker i think after fastest lap time the next tiebreaker is alphabetical order <laughs> like he was like what are we gonna do a tiebreaker after fastest lap time <laughs> alphabetical order okay that's the tiebreaker you know can you do fastest average lap Fastest mean time, or probably. Time. Uh, but yeah, the, the 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 software author is no longer with us, so we don't have that option. But when yeah, you guys, when you race, do you have you have the heats up on the screen, and then do you have the actual race so you can see? You know, your seven seven laps behind the leader. Do you have that up there? Or do you just gotta just do your best and see what happens? You, you just have to do your best, and so that's oh, why that's... that's why Victor, the guy who's got the internal clock often knows exactly how many laps he needs and exactly how many wins he needs because 
he's just able to keep track of those numbers. His his yeah. his profession was heavily number oriented, and so he's got a head for numbers, and so he just knows. And in fact, I think I don't know if it's a written rule or an unwritten rule, but basically we have a rule of you're not allowed to go over to the race management and look at the 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 results so far to see. The only thing you're allowed to know is what everybody else knows, and that's you know how many laps you just got on that last heat and how many you know who won that last heat so if you're if you're able to keep all those things in mind then you can know like victor you know how much how important it is not to screw up this next heat yeah that's tough racing Dude, it you is. Guys, it is Great, very you did you have sorry you had fuel do you get to see your fuel levels or how is that or is it just guess yeah you can see your fuel levels so on the okay. race manager uh, uh on the racing screen that is you know Russ's place is nice. He's got a big screen over on one side and another big screen on the other side. So if you're at one end of the track, you've got a, a nearby screen to look at. And they're nice and big. So, you know, old eyes, you don't even need your glasses to see what's going on. So you can see how many laps you're at. And the, the fuel is represented by a bar that, you know, starts out green and goes down and goes to yellow and then orange and red and stuff. And so you know how much fuel you're using. And so early on, I developed a strategy of, of, you know, as long as I didn't screw up the pit stop and, and overshoot the pit stop, uh, pit at eight laps, at, I'm basically running out of fuel at eight laps and I get a full tank. I pit at 16 laps because I've ran out of fuel and I get a full tank. And then knowing that I don't want to have to stop for fuel prior to the end of the race, I stopped at 20 laps to top up the tank to then just focus on racing and finish the race. And so, like I said earlier, if you if you get a perfect heat with no bobbles, no offs, and you get your fuel right, you can get 28 laps in most of the lanes. His track has uneven lane lengths, so so if you're on the long lane, it's a it's a push to get 28 laps. But it was it happened for a couple of us, and on the uh, the short lane, obviously it's a little bit easier, but you still have to hit all those marks, right? You can't. <laughs> you get an off or somebody else comes off in front of you and you have to slow down because of that you know we race we normally race crash and burn so the so the main difference on on last night's race because it's a longer race with fuel we do full marshalling so you so the cars come off and they get put back on as quickly as possible not all the marshals are as efficient as you would want them to be which is the norm you know you you always want them to be faster than they are regardless of how fast they actually are how many offs do you get i had one off the entire no, night. i mean how, in, in the rules how there's, many no, offs? there's no limit okay yeah yeah most slot racing with full marshalling there's no limit um <clears throat> but yeah so, but so there's you know there's only one time you're ever worried about how fast how slow the marshals are and that's when they're marshalling your car. Any other time, <laughs> they can be as slow as they like, right? Yeah, there was always, some, always quicker with someone else's car. Yeah, it, there was also some joking around with with one of the marshals because he would mistakenly put cars in the wrong lane once or twice or three, three or four or five times. So, but, but, but Greg, but, considering you were up against Rain Man, you did great. Oh, he, he yeah, he was a fantastic racer, and he and. It was a fantastic night of racing. Talk talk about your pit stop for the analog. How is that done? So it's a it's software based, obviously, and and uh, the electronics. You know, you, you need to have the appropriate electronics, and the the software needs to know what you're doing. But generally right. speaking, you're either you're either stopping between two detection points, or you're stopping under a detection point, so right. that the software registers that you've been under there for longer than driving under it therefore you must be stopped under there that's how russ's track works you got to stop under the light in order to register a lap and once you've been there for a certain amount of time it says okay he's pit stopped and starts refueling your car automatically and then you can leave at any time so you can splash and dash or you can wait until your car is full or you can sit there for the rest of the heat if you want to be silly about it but you decide when when you pull away from refueling um the only hard and fast rule is once you actually run to zero you lose power that your car your lane loses power your car stops and that happens from time to time when drivers are distracted or 
they're trying to just nail their their pit stop by just letting up at the exact right time for their car to coast to a stop exactly where it needs to be, but they overshoot it. Because if you undershoot it, it doesn't register your fuel until you've touched the light. So usually they'll overshoot it uh, and then they're, they've run out of fuel, but they're not under the light anymore. So it doesn't refuel them. So they're out of the, that, that was pretty much the only thing that would kick anybody completely out of the heat is overshooting on your last lap before your fuel ran out. If your power cuts, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's happened less and less you know over the over the years of racing at russ's track but it happened once or twice last night usually from distraction um but yeah i was i was hitting it i was hitting the nail on the head pretty much every time and and uh you know i would get to my point where if i took another lap i would be on fumes and you know uh, unlikely to, <laughs> to you know anyways it worked out in my favor I'm happy with the second place behind Eric. He's a fantastic driver. His car was was running great. And, you know, that that's the kind of racing I like. Is, you know, I I enjoyed coming second place last night more than I enjoyed coming first place where there's no there's nobody close to me. But that's me. Anyway, yeah, isn't there a saying that says it's better to lose by an inch than to win by a mile? Yeah, there's there's a saying like that. <laughs> Until it oh. comes time to cash the check. Until it comes time to cash the check. Good thing that we don't race for money or prizes of any kind. Even the status is is uh, not worth fighting for. <laughs> oh no, bragging rights only last a week anyway. Yeah, exactly. And and I'm taking all of my opportunity to brag about getting second place. <laughs> so you 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 basically were Scott Goodyear. Sure. Oh, okay. Well, he 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 has. He doesn't know who he is. Oh, okay, so nobody watched the Indy 500 this weekend or anything. Right? Oh yes, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. Well, he, well, he had the closest second place of uh, for for a long time in Indy history behind Allen's or Junior. And that happened to him twice, actually. Hey, you know, be Good proud of not getting first place. I mean, this is not a. A Talladega Nights situation here, you know. <laughs> In this situation, second is almost as good as first. Okay, so I'm done with my uh, bloviating. Does anybody so have any? Greggy Bobby? Go ahead, Brian. We can't call you Greggy Bobby. I mean, if you want to, I'm not gonna, <laughs> gonna mute you or kick you out within the first minute of you saying that. <laughs> Uh, so the floor is open. If you got anything you want to bring up, I have a topic that uh, that kind of came to mind through earlier conversations with people today. If nobody has anything they want to bring up, show off, or circle back on, I will pull that out of my hat. Since I don't see anybody, I'm oh, going to go oh, ahead and. Greg, I thought you were going to circle back on your R8 chassis if you had it oh. uh, close by. You want me? It's not close by. Do you want me to go get oh, it? Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. I, I was just trying to remember for everybody else. I'm sorry. It's, it's in the garage. I'll have to go out to the garage and get it. I want to know what Bill's working on so feverishly over there. I was gonna say. I was gonna uh, let me let me spot. Oh, Bill you know, check out check out his landscaping. It's cool. It's fantastic. Look at that. Look at that. Is that what you're working yeah. on? So yeah, you know, just as you guys were talking, I, I realized. So you know, I won that that drawing a little while back with the, for the magnetic racing, uh, uh, you yeah. know, grandstand or whatever. And I haven't shown it to you guys. So there you go. Nice. If, if I can do this, anybody can do this. That um, looks. Oh, Bill, that looks great. Like, yeah. Oh, thank great. you very much, Greg. Did you laser no, cut that? No, it came from uh, Greg. It was a magnetic racing kit. Oh, okay. And yeah. so, uh, that's a, so that is laser cut. Oh yeah, uh, right. Yeah, yeah. Sold by Magnetic Racing. Yeah. yeah. The uh, really, uh, yeah. Looking forward to. I've got an airbrush on the way. So, but uh, otherwise, no. What I'm working on right now, it. I so I've embedded the 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 track. You know, this Carrera Digital track into the into the landscape, or into the layout. It's not going anywhere. It's it's permanent. Uh, except in a couple of places where the four by eights, like I said, I'm moving in a couple of years. So knowing that 
there's a couple of places where, for example, there's a culvert that cuts half the size of the hill down. So I don't, I don't have to destroy quite as much as, I, as I'm just, you know, separating them. Um, but a lot of it right now is, is build up. Um, if, uh, I don't, this, this camera is pretty miserable sometimes, but if you look over here, last time, um, here we go. Last time you guys, or I showed this to you, this, uh, this area right here didn't exist. And so this is about in the last week and a half. Um, and then that out of the way, if you look there, as you can see, I'm starting to build essentially the net, um, uh, you know, around the back there. I also have it on, uh, let's see, this side here. And you can see there's still one section there um, that is, you know, where there's still a gap. And that's just flat out, I'm, I'm out of plaster. Uh, well, I'm out of plaster cloth. And uh, so I'm waiting on that. Lots of joint compound. So what I'm working on currently, um, you know, is basically in terms of, I don't know if anybody else does it this way, but I use foam, then I wrap it in um, painter's tape um, to get rid of all of the lines uh, because I just hate anything, any, any sort of mathematical sign means it's fake to me. So, so I do my best to get rid of all of that. So I, I form it that way. And then I use the joint compound to essentially round out anything else. And um, I'm working on the banks. Um, that's taking more work. There's a lot of buildup. So there's, you apply one coat and then you skim it. And then you apply another coat and you skim it. Um, I'm getting pretty good at it. So, but it's, it is really a lot of work, um, a little more than I had expected. Um, but it but looks, on Bill, the other hand, from what we can see, it looks great. Well, I'm, thank you. I'm really excited about where it's going. You know, it, kind of every day now, I just, you know, I look at it and I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, this is even better. Now, one of these days, the, so the back stretch there that I was showing you there, that I think I'm going to end up doing essentially like a uh, like a fence all the way along, like a wood fence. Um, and I can do that with the laser cutter. I just have to learn how to do it without torching the house. That seems to be my main issue right now. So lots of trying to learn lots of uh, skills in, you know, kind of in tandem. And when I get tired of dealing with one thing, I walk away and do something else. But Kit likes it because it looks like snow is all around it. You know, it, I, I like it and I'll probably leave some of it the, uh, but yeah, I just, I'm just not there for the paint yet. You know, I, it's still, it just seems like it's just growing like that, that, well, that close encounter of the third kind. I mean, this thing pretty soon, it's going to weigh about six, maybe 700 pounds. I mean, I'm, well, I'm well, I was, I was going to, well, I was going to ask you because of the foam, the foam is relatively light, but is it, is it, mm -hmm. is it that much plaster that gives it the weight or? Well, I, uh, so I was doing some cleanup because of what I do is basically the, the, uh, well, let's see, what did I get from the hardware store today? Oh yeah. <laughs> how many, oh, let's see how many, that's 3.3 .3 liters. I think it's five pounds, something like, I'm not sure. Um, so I threw those out the other day and there were nine of them. So I have a significant amount of joint compound on these, but I also have friends. And so they can carry, help carry these and load them. And I have a box truck that I can load these into or, you know, load the pieces into uh, when we go. So you, you, you may not have them after your moon. Uh, no, yeah, it, it's going to, yeah, they'll, they're not going to be uh, particularly pleased maybe for the first hour or so. But really, I mean, everybody that's, that's raced it when the track's been available has enjoyed it. Um, the real challenge is, you know, I mean, most of the time it's like right now the rails are taped because, you know, I'm not going to work on this stuff and just keep taping and untaping. It's a misery. That, that is the worst part of this entire hobby that I have found is taping those stinking rails. I'm just done. So anyway, hey, Bill. yeah, I, yeah. I, I used to, I used to build terrain out of uh, plaster and dental plaster, but mm -hmm. if you're looking for lightweight, did you try hydrocal? 
Yeah, I have made by I, USG. Okay, that's I like the lightest that. weight one I thought. I I do, and I I plan on using that, but I'm using that, or I'm planning on doing that more when I get into the molding. Um, so this is basically the base, and then essentially from there, then I'll build with the hydrocal or or not hydrocal. That's a something else. Dical, um, I think, is what I've got. Um, if well, you're not I, worried I about the weight, I'm, not, no I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one, but I'll chip in five bucks for your trust. Oh, <laughs> you know, I, I'm really at this point, at this point, I, I think we'll be okay for, on weight, but yeah, when it comes to the molds, that's, that's one of those things I'll get to it sooner than later, I guess, but I kind of feel like I, my hands are so full on everything else. You know, but you, know what? you said you said something that was really good though. When What's you if, if you take something to a point where you're kind of bored with it, yeah, you've always got something else you can work. That's the that's the beauty of of, of, of our hobby. Yeah, and yet you, you can always go out and get more joint compound. You know, so that yeah, that's in, in Genesis it says that God ran out of plaster. That's why it took him seven days. It was <laughs> going to be three days, but they had to wait on a hardware store. Somehow, when, when Bill mentioned that. Uh, he was going to burn his house down with a laser beam, uh, with a laser cutter. I had this vision of uh, 007 laying on the slab and, and, uh, and Goldfinger. And, uh, oh, yeah. It Bill, but it was Bill on the slab. You know, you know careful. <laughs> You see, John, you're 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 a much nicer person than I was. I was thinking of Austin Powers. I just want a slot car with freaking lasers. You know, you it would take no time at all. Uh, probably for me to burn it down if I if I wasn't so paranoid about burning it down. I I really, I mean, right when I think I've learned one lesson on on this, on the laser cutting particularly, you know, a lot of it has to do with heat dissipation is kind of what I'm learning at this point. But I still haven't learned that lesson well enough to stop burning things. And that's kind of the problem. So but that's that's not slot cars. Uh, but it is, you know, the great part about all the slot cars and all the layout stuff is, you know, it all comes together. And um, for some, for someone like me, that's that's kind of where the joy, you know, and the fun comes from is being able to tie them all together. So. And then you get anyway. to use it and have fun. Soon, soon. Once once I built those uh, nets, you know, for the uh, for the corners. So that's. That's kind of my main concern. You know, once you get a few nice cars, it, you, you suddenly are not as not as uh, excited about you know pulling down the the uh, the uh, trigger the whole way. You know? What are you going to use for your nets? What's that? What are you going to use for your nets? Oh, I'm I'm just building up. Um, I'm going to build up basically uh, fencing. Um, going another call back to Boone's slot uh, Boone's slot car garage. I think. Yep. Am I mixing these up? I forget. I'm I, I got fast, fast sports. I anyway. But Boone's has a great has a great one on fencing, and so I'm just going to basically span the back end, and then I mean, essentially, if a car hits it, it's not going to take out this fence in particular, but it will be enough to stop it from going over the side. It better at least. Let's see. I'm with you. Well, I like I like the. Uh you know, doing all the uh, scenery stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's fun. And I'm also like you, I get, I get bored of doing one thing and I hop and I do another thing and, and so far nothing is finished yet. So. Right. But you always have something you can do. That's, and that's, I mean, it's, it's kind of what I tell my wife is it's like having a little tickle in your brain. And it's like, when you, when you find that part of the hobby that you really like, it's like you get that little tingle in there or whatever, not literally, but you know. Well, you know, you know what, you're following your muse. Yeah. That's what you're doing. yeah. And, and so, you know, you just work your way, you know, it's like, okay, well, if I can get there with this, maybe I can get there with this. And you just kind of expand out from there. I, I, I just love, I haven't had a hobby um, like this before. And it's really, it's been a lot more fun. I, you know, I've built an arcade cabinet and all of that. That was drudgery compared to this. This is this is a lot of fun. Yep. Well, my my main question is, and I'm sure inquiring minds want to know, yep. while you're slapping joint compound on that big old mountain, you ever just look at it and go, hmm, this means something. Often. 
Is that, <laughs> very often. Is that too obscure for, for <laughs> the reference people out there? Anywho. Yeah, no, but but yeah, it, it, it definitely, I mean, I'm, it's really, I think I've said before, but I really, you know, I'll come out in the middle of the night or whatever, uh, you know, sometimes and I'm just like, go and I look at it and, you know, it's just, it's cool. It's, it's fun. It, and I'm sure, you know, it's kind of like how John probably looks at his molds um, and, you know, how basically anybody sets up their stuff. It's just that kind of feeling of satisfaction when you can, you know, do it the way you want to do it. So well, not, well, not only that, that, but you like there, in, in your case, no one has what you've created. You, right. It's just one of one. Well, yeah, my, my daughter will one day regret that I've ever made this probably, but it's all right. Yeah, yeah exactly. My only well, I don't know what happened. Because my cat likes to lay right in the middle mm -hmm. of my oval. And I'm like, I haven't figured out anything to ward the cat off. You yeah, know, well, th that, that's the problem with cats. You know, when you have a do dogs have masters, cats have staff. Cats are good. It, yeah, that, I would think a cat on a slot car track would be a lot of fun. I saw a cartoon just today. I think uh, the uh, on Boone's. I, I specifically it was it was a cat. It just the guy you know trying to run the uh, the slot car track and the cat just sitting there chasing it and going all over. Seems like a nice a nice uh, racing partner if you're willing to do all the cleaning. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Cats on slot car tracks are definitely fun. I'm yeah. sure everybody has seen that. Yeah. I've got a video on my channel from, from guys with cat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we're down to f between 10 and 15 minutes. Yeah. Anything else anybody wants to bring up? Uh, the, the topic that I had in mind might be longer than 10 or 15 minutes, but maybe not. Uh, does anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Okay. Well, I'll bring this up and maybe we can answer it. And 10 or 15 minutes but probably not uh, but basically i was i was answering questions to you know if somebody sending me private messages on various forums and it was basically you know i'm trying to provide guidance when the answer is always it depends right and in this case the guidance is regarding uh chassis uh float relative to the body or body float relative to the chassis and pod motion relative to the chassis. Uh, and, you know, of course he's, <laughs> he's asking for my advice and he's also kind of throwing out things like, oh, so this is what everybody does. And I'm like, no, that's not what everybody does. Some people do that, some people do other things. So it kind of boiled down to, you know, yes, it depends, but is there a 10 minutes worth of guidelines that one can provide about chassis and body flow and pod float with regards to lateral motion versus vertical motion. Because I know we've had lots of expert advice from Dennis and Chris and others about the, the idea is to decouple the chassis from the body so that you're not you know, binding everything together and, and you know, having one inertial mass and, and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it's also a vibration and frequency, and and, I, and again, what Dennis and and Chris have always said is that you know less is more. You don't really need a lot of of float, but yeah. I see what you're saying about it depends. It depends if you're running on wood, or if you're running on plastic, or yeah. and and I and I mentioned that you know I've seen guys in proxies and in club races where their bodies are so loose that you'd think they were not attached at all, except for the fact that it doesn't fully come apart. <laughs> and, and he, you know, he's like, oh, so that's what you do. And I'm like, no, that's not what you do. So I bet I, I don't have any like, I don't have any rules of thumb other than guess and check and try and test and do other things. Well, Greg, after two weeks ago, when this kind of came up a little bit in Dennis, answered one of my questions about why do you tighten it down or loosen it up. So I went back to, to my um, um, NSR Formula One cars and I did a series of tests um, based on tight and loose and, you know, then work my way down like half a turn, quarter turn, that kind of thing. And interestingly enough, on my track, as I made the cars tighter and the chassis tighter, they ran faster and they, they handled the track better but i could also and mine's an oval now 
where I can see on a road course where you're going different ways, it might want to be more loose. Um, so it is one of those questions like maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You run with magnets, John? Uh, yes. Yeah. I must say that I also have the poly cars without magnets and I've loosened them up and gone faster. So that it's back to that, you know, what are you running and how are you running is part of the answer to that question. And what tires do you run? Round ones usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but apart from that. <laughs> uh, I'm using gel claw. Silicone uh -huh. tires. Uh -huh. well, so gel claws are not silicone. Yeah. And that's on a Carrera track. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can say that if you're running magnets, you definitely don't want any movement in the chassis. That, that's been my experience with it. With, uh, on, a, on a bumpy scale electric track like mine, um, the movement is all over the place. Some cars like it, some cars don't. Um, if you want, if you've got a little too much traction where it's um, wheeling out of, out of the slot, a lot of times eliminating the float will make it run a little bit better. So that may be what you're experiencing sometimes. Um, and I've got some cars you just, they like to be tightened up. I loosen the screws, a couple of them, it doesn't work. It's just one of those things. And you test and you test, and then you worry about the day when it doesn't work. <laughs> well, I know when I go to, uh, we have a track that is a, an Inco track, but it's also got a lot of elevation and turn. It's, it's, it's made to look like Road America, or Road Atlanta, it's kind of a combination of dreams. And I need to loosen my cars when I go to that track because they like to bend a little bit through the banks and stuff like that. So even the magnet cars? I uh, no, we, I'm sorry. On that track, we're only running non-magnet. Okay. All right. Yeah. So so in this particular instance, I believe, and hopefully this person, if they're watching, doesn't get mad at me for getting it wrong. They're running uh, on Carrera track, so hard plastic track. And with a variety of tires, though I believe uh, primarily urethane tires, but probably stock and silicone as well. And we've already talked about you know mixing mixing tire compounds. But uh, if, Dennis, so if I've run you, both, Greg. I've run uh, urethane and and uh, silicone, and uh, both do well on the uh, slot. Uh, you know the Carrera. Track. Yeah, as long as the track is clean, pretty much, pretty much everything will work pretty good on a clean track. Mm -hmm. um, so leaving that discussion aside, I'm wondering if, if David or, or Dennis, whoever wants to chime in, if you knew you were going to a Carrera track, non-magnet, uh, and you were, you were taking, uh, you know, any given potted car, you know, slot it, spirit, you know, MR slot car, whatever, what would be the for, and and let's just say urethane tires, just just to nail that down. Would you go looser or tighter? I mean, and and what would what would be your progress of testing and checking? Well, if I can take that, uh, I would start with a with the basic setup that I always use on a on a slotted car, and that is everything needs to be loose, but only just. Um, uh, vertical movement is is uh, is not as important as a little bit of lateral movement. So you you don't want a lot of movement around everywhere. But the the body screws are more important very often than the pod screws. As long as everything is flat and straight, right, and that screwing the pot up tight uh, is not pulling the chassis crazy. Having the body loose gives you more benefit than having the pod loose. That said, I would have both of them loose, uh, maybe on the regular screws, maybe half a turn on the screws. Personally, on the, on the slotted cars where they have that Evo 6 set up with the two screws in front and two outriggers and two at the back, I will take the outriggers right out because I don't like this. Because I like the pod to rock a little bit. Um, but what I would do 
going to a, going to a track that I didn't know, the first thing I would take with me would be a screwdriver so that I can adjust it when I get there, right? So that I could play with it. And the second thing that I would take would be a whole bunch of different types of tape. And I would start with the basic car without any tape on it. And I would play with the screws a little bit. And then I would start taping with, um, you know, with um, medical tape or with insulation tape or with that fiber tape to see where I was, depending on how much traction there is on the track with the particular tires. If there's a lot of traction, go stiffer and stiffer on the tape. Uh, but in general, you don't want a lot of movement anywhere in any of those. Um, I know Maurizio uh, from Slotted likes to use the big head screws for the, for the pod because he only wants a little bit of vertical movement, not very much lateral movement, but that's his preference. I prefer not to have the vertical movement, but to have a little bit of lateral movement. It feels, the car feels better to me. But it's all empirical. Uh, there, is no, there is no theory that can tell you which is best for what. You know, Dennis, what are you taping when you talk about tape? I'm putting tape across the chassis between the pod and the chassis. If it's, if it's a potted car, like on that, I would run uh, two pieces of insulation, a black plastic insulation tape, right along the, along the car, uh, between the motor pod and the chassis, either side of the slotted hole of the motor, right from the back as far as I could get it to the front. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a scale auto, right? Oh, let's uh, get out there. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. Any of them. Hang on. Let me go find a car, John, and I'll tell yeah. you. Hold on a moment. One. Well, Dennis, that, that kind of answers my question. I mean, there's no, he says no, it's empirical. There's no real uh, science. I mean, uh, it seems like, you know, weight going here would help this wheel, you know, make traction, but then vibration, you know, by everything being loose would be a detriment to that. So, uh, like you say, it sounds like it's just all experience to you guys and and the way you've learned to, uh, with all your experience, uh, adapt to tracks, you know, adapt, like you said, it depends on the track and the car and all of that. And I, I get more feel of what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I think it's important to, to accept that because it depends, you can't just say, well, do this to all the cars for all the tracks. Uh -huh. you, gotta, you gotta know all the different, I mean, you, you benefit from knowing all the different methods so that you can test all of those different methods to find which works best for you for that car on that track. Because and like in some clubs you can't use tape, for example. Yeah, if, there's no, if you can't use tape, then, then you've gotta find some other means to achieve what, you, what you're going for within, this, within the rules. I was yeah. just going to say that's really close to real racing, by the way, yeah, because when you show up at a track, you're, you're always tuning, always. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's racing in miniature, right? <laughs> so if you've got a club that says no taping the pods, well, do they allow suspension? Do they allow, you know, dampening in any other way? Mm -hmm. you know? Well, that was just like the, the cars that we ran on the, uh, on the uh, mini Indy, I took off and put on my oval. And they ran terrible on my oval because we set them up to run on this big, long kind of square oval. And when I moved to mine, it was, it's totally different. And so you, you had to retune everything. Yeah. And, and within the rules of whatever competition. Exactly. All right, I'm back. All right, so, so what you got? Uh, I don't have any Formula Ones done, but uh, That's there's, okay. a, there's, a, there's a standard slotted. Um, yeah, I've got one of those. 917, okay. And it's all right. This particular one runs great the way it is. Uh, the, the pod has very, very, a very little bit of movement on it. Uh, you can almost not see it. There's no suspension in it. Uh, sometimes I'll do, sometimes I will do that, all right? So there's a piece of black insulation tape just across there, joining the, just holding the pod uh, to the side of the chassis. And what it does is it gives a little bit of dampening to whatever little bit of movement there is there, right? 
sometimes they need much more dampening than that, and then I'll do that. Oh, wow. Right? Where I got a piece of tape all the way along the one yeah. side and all the way along the other side. Right? Now, that's black insulation tape on that, which I find works really well with the rubber tires that I use uh, and on the track that I run. Uh, you could use uh, this medical tape, right? Which right. is um, that that yeah. funny little that that stuff, right? It tears easily. It's uh, it's a bit softer than the than the um, than the insulation tape, so it gives yeah. a little bit less damping. Sometimes that works. Mm. Sometimes I will use fiber tape, right? And yeah. this particular one has a very very fine. Uh, but a lot of fibers in it, right? Uh -huh. And it's actually very, it's actually quite stiff. I use this a lot on my on my one twenty four scale cars when I'm taping those, mm -hmm. because it's it's much stronger and it gives much more. It it gives much. It it's, it dampens the movement a lot more. So are so, you are you uh, Dennis? Are you dampening it this way and not this way? Uh, that. To an extent, depends on the way that the chassis is designed. So most of it is this take, away. Take that portion you were just showing me. So. Uh, this one. Yeah. Well, basically what that's doing is it's dampening this movement uh -huh. and a little bit of whatever movement okay. the chassis I got allows I see what you're in that doing. Okay. Right? Yeah. So if this was a slotted car with four, with four screws, two at the front and two at the rear, then I would tape it all the way down so that it's, it's, it's dampening the movements up and down and back to front and this away. So all of those movements are being dampened a little. Some so of them what are, you do, what are you doing more. with your screws at that time? Are you, are you? They're always still about a half a millimeter, uh, a half a turn loose. Okay, I got right? you. You don't, you, the, the, the amount of movement is controlled by the screws. The, Dampening of that amount of movement it's controlled frequency. by the tape. Yeah. Got it. So it looks like to me, Dennis, you're 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 allowing it to move up and down or side to side, but that you want it to be dampened and and correct, correct. Otherwise, it's it not it. vibration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's fun to it's fun to play with and try it. Yeah. You know, try these different things and just you know. Mm -hmm. Dennis, why Dennis, why you stepped out looking for that? I made the. The comment: Some some tracks you can't take by, because of rules. Yeah. What what do you do when you get to a track like that? How do you? Then I'll play. I'll play with the amount of movement on the screws. On screws, okay. Um, I've done other things, like for instance, using uh, some grease in the little in the pockets where the heads of the screws are. Put a little thick grease in those pockets, right? Uh, because you're not taping it, but it still dampens the movement a little bit. Put a little bit of tape over the top of the screw and tell them that it's there so the screw doesn't fall out. And then that just keeps the grease in. Um, maybe like Mike was saying, uh, to use those little foam, um, uh -huh. the little foam suspension parts from Thunderslot. I cut those in half so they're half as high and use those sometimes or little bits of... Um, little bits of uh, silicone or yeah, urethane uh, tape between the between the, the pod and the chassis mm -hmm. like like Chris Walker does that's the other way if they don't allow you to tape all of those suspension kits on plastic track are generally okay on wood tracks they don't really make much difference one way or the other because the wood tracks are smooth usually and, yeah. and suspension kits will be another thing you want to make sure is allowed in the rules so in the rules oh, sure mm -hmm. um, we're past our two hours so i'm going to stop the recording but obviously you guys keep talking about car tuning and stuff and hopefully whoever's watching got some useful information and until then we'll say goodbye <laughs>